Why is everyone laughing? <laughs> it's because the, oh, because the title, ha, ha, ha. All right, so my name is Steph. I'm from there. Wheat in Canada. I figured this, for Americans, you might understand this better than an actual map of the US, I mean of Canada. Um, for a while, I lived in New York. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I got to work with Luke. It was a great time. Um, but since then, I have uh, moved to a relatively new job at Yahoo. I'm doing lots and lots of open source, which is fantastic. It allows me to have fun and hobbies. So now, when I told people I longboarded, if I was in New York, they understood what I meant. But when I was talking to someone on the other coast, they're like, oh, you surf? I'm like, no. But now, I can unambiguously say that I can longboard. I'm not very good at it yet but it is a lot of fun. And when you fall down, you don't get like as scratched up on the pavement <laughs> as you do when you fall down on longboards. Um, I also like giving talks like this one. Um, I'm a husband with a very patient wife. You guys may have seen my birds on Twitter. Um, they like perch on laptops while you're pairing and they make you more productive. This is our other one, except he eats headphones and power adapters so he can't pair. Um, I suspect well, as maybe I shouldn't say this, but our speakers, we got these little helicopters, the flying helicopters. I'm excited to chase my birds around the apartment with it. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, I'm also on the Ember core team. Um, I, one of my primary responsibilities is Ember CLI. Um, so I like to fix all the bugs, complain a lot on Twitter, hopefully not at people, but about stuff. I know stuff is created by people, but I don't know. I complain about my own stuff often. Um, I like to look at working on Ember CLI and Ember and all of these things allows me to, if I can maybe fix a problem easier in one part of the stack, it just gets easier across the board. So being able to look at a big, broad spectrum allows for some fun stuff. This talk won't be about broad spectrum stuff, but very focused things I think we can do with our Ember apps to be a little bit more productive. But a recent addition to being on the Ember Core team and all this stuff is I now attend TC39. So in addition to Yehuda, there are now two Ember Core team members who attend TC39. Um, so I have to say, I, I was really, working at Yahoo allows me to attend TC39. Um, and Yehuda had mentioned that maybe this is something I want to consider at some point. And I was really apprehensive. I didn't want to go. I just imagined like an un unproductive three days of bike shedding. Um, but I have to say, after attending the first meeting, I feel that um, the language is in pretty good hands. There's a really good counterbalance. There's a lot of very strong academics, uh, runtime implementers, and consumers of, the frame, of, of JavaScript. And I find that um, although there is some bike shedding, I, I think that it, it's a extremely, we're extremely lucky to have our hands in such a good, strong committee. Uh, maybe in the past it wasn't so, but now it feels really good. Anyway, so going forward, Assume that this is in front of all my code samples because, well, slides are small, yada, yada, yada. Um, so at Yahoo, we have a very large number of Ember apps and Ember developers. I, I think Mike and myself have tried to figure out what the exact number is, and every week we find a few more people using Ember, so I don't even know how many people, but more than I know. Um, but having so many developers and looking at lots of code bases and then looking at common bugs that we have, there are two very related points that cause probably the most bugs. The first one is needs and controllers. And the second one that amplifies the problems with needs is observers. So who here has an Ember app in production right now? That's really cool. A few years ago, it would have been much less. Who here has never used Ember before? Uh, come on, graffiti, Mr. Graffiti there, it's too good to work with Ember. Um, <laughs> graffiti even has observers, so <laughs> who here feels that they could live their life without observers in Ember? <laughs> who has tried? So, one of the fun parts of doing some code reviews at Yahoo is um, this discussion. It happens almost all the time. I see someone had added a few observers, and I say, what if there were no observers? How would you solve this? And it immediately turns into another comment being like, you're crazy. And I say, come to my desk. We'll talk about it. 
And usually, I'm gonna, I, I think I've done this conversation enough times and been pretty successful with it um, that I'm gonna try to have it with all of you at the same time. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but when you're about to use an observer, just think, what if there are no observers? How would this system work? I think we often use observers as like replacement for method calls or replacement for other stuff. It's just a hammer and um, Next time you're about to use an observer, take a step back and just think about it a little bit before you actually use it. So one thing we've talked about, haven't instituted yet, is if you're about to use an observer, imagine it costs you 20 bucks to use a single observer. You're probably gonna think about it twice. You're gonna really think about that case where you have a for loop over add observer, <laughs> to add a whole bunch of observers. You're gonna really have to think about it. And um, well, out of all the scenarios I've seen so far, there haven't been any where we have actually needed those observers. So, and the resulting code was much easier, much more testable, much less buggy, and fun stuff. Anyways, so I think Ember, we screwed up. These two things look very much the same. And they, they can sometimes appear like they're functionally equivalent. So the top one is a computed property, which returns the value of the concatenation of first name and last name. And the second one is an observer, who observers or return values don't really matter but they have the ability to set the value. So these are fairly similar, maybe, on the outward. And when we create these two objects, so going forward, friend will always be the computer property case and foe will always be the observer case. You notice the first difference here. And that is when we create foe, we don't get the full name. But when we create friend, we in fact do get the full name. Well, why is this? Well, there's this weird thing in Ember where if you pass attributes to create, they are considered as the initial state of the object, meaning they're just how the object begins its life. It's kind of strange to emit change events for that. In Ember, there's this interesting thing called on init, which actually is after init. And if you add properties in on init, which is after init, change events do fire. So there's this weird trick that you can do where you can actually do on init on the observer, which forces the observer to compute after initialization thereby basically in this very simple example making computer properties and observers appear pretty close to being the same thing. So now once we've added that foe when I create them immediately full name is in fact full name. Success. <laughs> Go home. Alex has a great picture of Robert Jackson photoshopped on his face. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I really wanted to find it but I couldn't. Anyways but so this actually isn't true. Let's take a closer look. Um, so I'm gonna throw in some logging and basically I'm just gonna log each of these computer properties and observers to kind of get a feel for what's actually going on. So if I go and create friend, I create them and then once I grab full, full computes and it computes the full name. Unfortunately with the observer case, full is computed eagerly. The observable experience appears the same but this little detail actually burns us quite a bit. So first lessons, the difference between computer properties and observers are observers are eager. So with basic scenarios, it really doesn't make that much of a difference, although it isn't maybe nice. Where it becomes fun is what if we added another dependent property? So we have reversed, which is just the reverse of the full name. So in this case, we may create a computer property where we created a dependent key that depends on full name. And I just wrote the logging in there first time. In addition to that, I'll do the same thing for the observer case. And then if we go back to our friend example, uh, when I get full, it computes. When I get reversed, it lazily complete, compute, comp ah, computes. Unfortunately, with observers, they're both eager. So observed experience looks the same, but they're happening even if I don't need it. If I never even want reversed or full, extra work happens and something feels very fishy about this. And then when I say this to people, like, well, if I only have a few models, who cares, right? It's a little extra work, it's not a big deal. But this is... <laughs> Those same people will like a week later come and be like, so Ember's really slow. I have 4,000 models, why doesn't this work? So um, as part of the downside of observers is they have a huge work amplification potential. 
So clearly, observers are not computed properties. Observers are eager. Now, there's a second twist on observers versus computed properties, and that is consistency. So imagine I have a friend who currently has the first name of Stefan and the last name of Penner. And then I go and I mutate first name and last name to be Eric uh, Bryn Jolson. So Eric Bryn is actually a Viking. You can see proof by his legit last name. Um, and in the computer property case, everything appears totally fine. <laughs> but in the observer case, because full depends on first name and reverse depends on full, um, as soon as I change first name, reversed and full both compute. And for a small period of time, I'm going to have Eric Penner. And I don't think uh, my wife or his girlfriend would be too thrilled about that. Um, so this is weird. And if you guys have observers in your apps, this is actually happening. But then when you come for the second property set, it corrects itself. So you might not even know that you're doing copious amounts of strange work um, along the way, only to get a very simple final answer. Uh, again, all these cases, if you compound the properties and the dependent key chains, it gets crazier. But then finally, when you set last, it corrects itself. Yay, yay, eventual consistency, blah, blah, blah. Um, now what you often see is inside of an observer, people will do some kind of calculation. And as a result of that calculation, they might do something. Now, it's probably dubious to be doing calculations inside of observers, but this illustrates the problem fairly well. You will basically have an indefined middle state where age and year uh, are in incorrect. You can cause some funky, funky states. Now, there is a tiny workaround for very specific scenarios, and you can use ember dot or object.set properties. Uh, and unfortunately, that only works in the simple cases. In the really fun bugs, you have objects in different parts of your app all setting it. And there's no sane way to sort of coalesce all those things together unless you really understand the whole experience. There's an opportunity where Ember maybe could make observers asynchronous. Um, but if we just use computer properties, this more or less just doesn't exist because they're lazy and on demand. Now, I don't know if you guys can, can anyone actually see that? OK, so I'm going to read it. It's kind of weird. But remember, the context is extremely important. Um, so your, your hardness, I finally adapted to it. So I'm assuming this is some anime show, and hopefully it's an appropriate anime show. But um, <laughs> one thing you lose with observers, you don't know why you were invoked. You have no idea what the system, what happened in the system to cause your computer property, uh, to cause your observer to compute. Um, so a quick example, uh, again, we have our faux friend here, and we have um, a two-way bound input value. Um, and our client says, whenever someone types first in the input, I would like the model just to autosave. I don't, we have a cool UI, we don't need a save button, we just save all the time. So developer throws in the observer, is happy, ships it. Well, the first problem with this one is for every keystroke you're sending an AJAX request might not be ideal. So the developer goes and he throws a debounce in the middle of that. Then he realizes in testing that the debounce is now causing him testing grief, so he goes and cancels the test. You guys should actually do this. But not with observers. Um, a few months later, the product manager is like, by the way, we, we, we want everything to be real time. When that employee and this employee both collaborate together, we want data to flow back and forth. And all of a sudden, we're pushing data into the store. Um, and in the observer case, this actually means our observer is going to compute because full name may have changed. So as, as the user goes and types something, they may get the message. And now, every two seconds, because of the, the debounce, um, we're actually going to be constantly saving and reloading the data. Um, so as a pro, we have now implemented a really crappy form of synchronization. Um, but it really wasn't intended. And in every one of these cases, people, when you talk about it, it's like, you know, I'll be careful in this case. Maybe I'll put my app in some mode when it's pushing or this. Well, let me tell you a story. What, once upon a time, only in Bangalore, some of my coworkers may be laughing, there was a moment.js date range generation plus observer cycle happening. Um, so basically, because of the time zone, there was a glitch somewhere. Many observers in the system. And when you were in that time zone at a specific time, 
you would compute all the dates from like 1970 to now. <laughs> and it turns out moment.js isn't necessarily the quickest library. This particular function was deopting. So it would take precisely 15 minutes. Then it would release and the developer or the user could go on their merry way. <laughs> um, so interestingly, the code that actually had these observers and all this fun stuff hadn't been touched in quite some time. But it was just the shifting of data through the system that caused the cycle to happen in a strange way. And because uh, observers don't know why they have in fact been invoked, um, they just receive any change as, hey, I gotta do work. These types of problems actually happen quite often. Hopefully not something that's time zone related, um, but they still happen. So the solution to this is we want to restore context when we actually make choices when we do stuff. Uh, you may have heard this before. It's the whole bindings down, actions up thing. Well, instead of doing the observer to see when first changes, the solution would be when there's an event that gets emitted or an action that gets emitted, and from that action, the developer makes a choice. So when the user, when the input changes, then I would actually explicitly like to call save. So the cool thing about this is, if first changes for any other reason than from user input, you're not gonna try to accidentally save something. So now we have restored context, and there's no real observer in this case that the developer has written. And because we're pedantic, we have the debounce. We actually have to make sure to cancel the debounce when we destroy the object, or we're gonna have pains in our tests. And Steph won't debug them for you anymore. Um, next part of this is, when I was thinking about the implications of observers, is something very similar as the law of Demeter. And this is a common OO law that basically states uh, an object should only talk to its direct neighbors. The further away it reaches from its direct neighbors, the more brittle a system is going to get. Now, there isn't really a law, but it more or less is always true. Um, observers have a very similar problem, and that is <laughs> unexpected side effects are unexpected. I love reading stuff that I wrote. <laughs> So very small little difference here between Ember 1 and Ember 2, and it makes actually a massive difference. Um, in the first example, old is implicitly two-way bound. When first changes, it will change the model, the controller. It will change many things. When, when new changes, because it's opt-in, it will only change, it will only percolate, the changes will only propagate as far as you've opted in to allow it to change. So, it might be a little bit small. All you need to know is the top is the model and the bottom is the template. This is the old model. Input changes, the component might change, the controller might change, the model might change, the binding changes. In any order, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna flow and in this scenario, it'll probably work fine. Your app grows, this starts to happen. And then it grows and this starts to happen. You change full name and all of your controllers that share that model that may have at one point cared about that model now start listening in on these changes, making choices, calling callbacks, all this stuff. And this is almost never the intention. And so this is a real scary part about having non-optional two-way binding throughout a system. And in this case, observers that live at any one of these places, they're eagerly computing. So if, even if we had two-way data binding and no observers and only computer properties, if no one is listening, the computer properties would just do nothing. Um, but in the case of observers, they're always doing crazy funny things. Um, and then it gets even better. You connect all the controllers with needs. You add routing. And you have the funnest bugs that keep consultants extremely well paid for a long time. Um, but there's a really easy solution to this, and that is control the, the scope of where these changes flow. So in the new model in Ember, basically bindings, all these fun things are one way by default, which means data just flows down. If in fact you wanna propagate data back up one level, it is in fact your responsibility to opt in. You can either use something like the mute helper or the previous example where you actually just use an action where the user clicked save or an input event fired and you propagate it up. Now, if in fact you wanna propagate it further, it's again your choice. Does this mean it's slightly more verbose? Potentially, but I think, I don't think it actually will be more verbose. 
But what it means is it means you know what the side effects are of what you're going to do. So if we go back to the law of Demeter, the big problem was sometimes your side effects are going to be brittle because your code changes, but sometimes your side effects just reach far too far. So it's kind of similar. We probably need a better name for it, but yeah. The cool thing is now if we take the same model and apply it to the larger system, our change actually only affected this tiny little part of the system, and we don't have to worry about crazy repercussions. Who here who has big Ember apps has had bugs where depending on which route they enter, they have some bugs sometimes and not other times? This is this problem. And for the other people who didn't put up your hand, you have this problem. <laughs> so by understanding the context, why something changed, by preventing huge side effect explosions, which are costly, and potentially resulting in inconsistent data and just bad stuff. Uh, the best example is um, when you've routed into a deeply nested comment, routed back out, routed somewhere else, and all of a sudden now you have an error in some weird unrelated controller. That's that inconsistency problem I showed before where you have that if statement making a choice. Rather than it being a numerical comparison, it's probably this object just doesn't exist yet because you've entered in a weird way. But often it's just because observers have introduced synchrony throughout your entire application. So here's a fun example. Just everything possible you can imagine is wrong with this. But it looks perfectly reasonable at first glance. Um, so first of all, we have enemies controller, which is connected to friends controller. And anytime any full name changes on the friends controller, save every friend. So the first thing that happens here is if I go and change three full names, we're actually going to call that save three times synchronously and immediately. Um, the crazy thing is this controller may not even, its template that matters may not even be in view anymore. It may just be ambiently present, doing its thing, computing, causing havoc, making your app slow and hard to debug. So the solution for this is actions up, bindings down, kill the observers, uses computer properties, and everything becomes lovely. Picture kind of worked. I like this guy. <laughs> um, so, like I said before, observers are the data binding hammer. They exist. Why do they exist in Ember in the first place? I think when you're building a data binding system, you're like, well, when that thing changed, I want to do something. It seems perfectly reasonable. And I think they're a great tool to maybe explore. They might be a good primitive that exists that us as developers in apps shouldn't really interact with. Um, but Ember definitely screwed up when they made computer properties and observers really feel like siblings in this world. So there are a few examples where today um, in 1x Ember, observers are maybe the tool you must use. Um, the only example that I can really think of that's a totally legit one is when you're pushing data out of Ember. So an example here is whenever data changes, I would like to render a D3 component. This makes perfect sense. D3 isn't aware of Ember's observation system. It isn't aware of the change tracking. It isn't aware of these things. So we have no choice <coughs> but to, when data changes, push it into D3 and tell D3 to do its work. You will notice, though, that this is a little bit more verbose than maybe what some people do when they write observers. The first thing is, when you're writing an observer, observers are synchronous. But computer properties are lazy. And we want to allow computer properties to continue to be lazy. But if we have observers, who synchronously pull data out of computer properties, what happens is almost all of your computer properties now start feeling like observers because your observers are pulling at them immediately. And people then wonder, Steph's totally crazy. Observers and computer properties are totally the same thing. But actually, it's some component, some select component deep in their application that's forcing computer properties to become synchronous. So the solution is when, in fact, data changes, we're going to schedule once on the render queue to draw. But as soon as we schedule something once, that's a little bit async inside Ember's run loop, we actually have to still make sure that the current component is still in DOM. It's totally possible that the same change that caused data to change made the component not be renderable anymore. This is a little bit verbose, but if you're using components or and observers today, this is probably the approach you have to take. Actually, this is the approach you will have to take. Now, in theory, we could sugar this up a little bit more and call it a day. But in the new component render hooks that we have, or lifecycle hooks that we have, 
we could actually remove the observer, the on did insert element, all the guards, all that fun stuff, by just allowing Ember to call a method that does the exact same thing. So again, no more, comp no more observers. Ember just has given us a better primitive that's called at the right point in time so we have sufficient context. It's called only once. It's called all, basically it's, it's more or less what we implemented before, but the framework is doing it for us. So again, if you have to use an observer today, maybe you're still in the process of refactoring your application, um, try to push information out of Ember. You don't want to end up in a situation where in an observer you're setting properties. If an observer you're setting properties, you can absolutely just invert that and make it a computed property. Again, if you're using an observer, you must schedule for laziness, and ideally you want to schedule once for uniqueness and be very aware of the life cycles in play. So if you're inside of a component, be aware that your component may no longer be in DOM and then you shouldn't do any work. Does this sound like a pain in the ass? Absolutely, and that's probably why you shouldn't use observers at all. Anyway, so actions up, bindings down, and that's it. Are there any questions? Questions? Questions, 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 questions. Everyone questions. totally feels good about this killing observers thing? Yeah, no one feels bad about it? Jay doesn't like it. So, are there actual plans to actually do away with observers or just to discourage them a la not documenting them as much or when you document them to basically explain the yeah. use cases? So I don't think there's ever a silver bullet for any problem. I think observables, observers or observables make an interesting primitive, um, but they're just really hard to actually use in a consistent way. So will Ember eventually not have any observers? It's entirely possible, I don't know for sure, but I think that in most cases where people want to use observers, it's because there's some deficient API that is missing or they're just using them incorrectly. What I would personally like to see is for observers to be much more ugly to use, uh, so they're slightly more discouraged when you use them. But there might be some part of the API where you need to experiment for now. To, to add on to that, when, um, I've, the only time I usually see myself using observers is actually during debugging. I, I, I um, will throw in an observer just literally to see what's going on with, with you know, a computed property or, or at some state in something when, when something changes. Um, that's honestly the only reason why I use observers. Would you, is there any pattern you'd recommend instead, instead of creating like an ad hoc observer? No, I think that's a great pattern okay. to use observers when debugging. Hopefully not when you're debugging other observers though. That might be a little <laughs> bit of a, a little bit of a nightmare. I, I think observers, I think there's a future for object observes or object dot observations in the, in the language itself. But I think its purpose is really as a low-level primitive to get ac access to something that there is just no other way to reasonably do. Um, maybe, in fact, that will be sufficient. Maybe it'll have enough fewer caveats than our current observation system. But it does feel like a primitive that can be useful, especially when experimenting and potentially debugging. So uh, another time I found the need for observers is like making a computed property with a dynamic dependent key like using ember.addObserver and then specifying a model and then a property that's a variable that I pass in. Oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> did, you hear, did you hear that? Yeah, so for those that didn't hear it, the question was, um, he has an example where an observer is used to add, um, to basically emulate the fact that there's no concept of a dynamic dependent key inside of a computer property. Um, most scenarios that I've seen that are actually solved by the actions up, data down thing. Most of the time when data is actually changing, it's as a result of something that happened. Um, it's very uncommon actually for you just to be poking your way through an object graph and be like, anytime this random thing in the far corner changes, do something. It's just a very strange and unnatural thing actually. Um, there might be use cases that I'm not seeing. I haven't encountered any so far. So if you have a good one, uh, let me know. Um, I'd love to play with it and hopefully give you a better solution. Would the, Hello. Is it, would the uh, browser implemented observer 
would that be more performant than the Ember Observer? Can that be an option? Yeah, so if the JavaScript runtimes implement object observes or object at observations, the first thing I believe they will be is they will be asynchronous. So one of the things with Ember's observers is they do fire immediately, whereas what will actually, in theory, happen, depending on where the spec lands, is when you change a Pojo's first name, and you change it immediately twice, you will only know the last time that it changed. Uh, so what that means is you don't have that eager consumption problem. Uh, in addition to that, it should be significantly faster than, uh, than the system that we've implemented. Um, although interestingly, this weird side effect with how observers work, if you have observers in a controller or a computer property today, and you're moving around your app, and sometimes it feels sluggish, um, often it's actually the last controller that you left, or last component that you left, and you're going to a new one. It's the last one that's cleaning up, because people will have like prepare controller or clean up controller calls in their routes, it's actually the cleanup that's causing all of these side effects to happen that's causing performance problems. So observers are really not terribly slow, but it's actually these unexpected side effects that typically cause massive performance problems. Any other questions? So um, this, this isn't so much of a question, but um, the, the single biggest case where we see observer abuse at Yahoo is where some component does not fire an action and someone's trying to use data binding to respond to a change in some value. So when you're building components, make sure you are providing a first class way to bind actions as well. Um, because that's that once you introduce into the system like something that you're just listening for value changes to, um, it, this observerness starts to just bleed through the whole app. Yeah, like I said before, if you have that one observer pulling eagerly, your entire system all of a sudden becomes eager and slow and brittle and all that fun stuff. So sometimes it's just as easy as fixing one component. So as you guys write more awesome components at emberaddons.com, make sure that they don't use these poor practices. Out of curiosity, I'm not, I've never done iOS development, but I know like a lot of the concepts in Ember come from that world or you know the Cocoa world in general. Is this a pattern that has... Uh, is this a performance optimization that has been done in Coco, where people are relying more on whatever their equivalent of CPs are moving away from observers? So if I say anything, I have no idea. All, All these right. people are shitting you. Maybe someone else in Here's the audience Here's our Coco expert idea. in the room. <laughs> Luke, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? No. Let's just assume maybe. Well, thank you very much. If anyone has any more questions, you can find me afterwards or bug me on Twitter.